All right, how's everyone doing? Must be tired. Almost through the first day. <laughs> um, have one more hour. Uh, a lot of learning today. So, I mean, so far today, you've learned about cloud computing. You've learned a lot about RNA seq. Just general introduction: uh, what RNA seq is, some of the challenges that you face with RNA seq that you don't see with other platforms like DNA seq. And you learned about sequencing. You learned about how. Uh, the libraries are constructed for RNA-seq and uh, what kind of files you generate after you sequence, so FASTQ uh, files. We haven't had a chance to go over the quality, assessing the quality of the sequences, FASTQ files, um, but we'll do that, I think, uh, either later today during the integrated assignment uh, or tomorrow morning. We're going to be spending the next hour or so uh, talking about alignments, focusing on alignments. So we'll talk about some of the challenges in RNA-seq alignments specifically that we don't see in other platforms. Uh, we'll talk about different alignment strategies that are present with RNA-seq data. Then we'll focus on one specific tool, HiSat2, and I'll break it down for you how it works and we'll provide some, some examples. That's the tool that we're going to be using for the rest, rest of the uh, workshop. And then we will talk about the output of that aligner, the BAM file, and uh, some other formats that will be useful uh, along with BAM files, such as BAT formats, and how you can manipulate uh, uh, the BAM file. And then talk about visualization of RNA-seq alignments. The second part of, of this module is uh, doing some QC, so alignment QC assessment. What metrics should you look at to uh, help you figure out whether the run was successful, whether the, the, the quality of the sample was good, um, and how do you visualize that? What kind of reports can you generate? And then finally, BAM read counting and uh, determination of variant allele uh, expression status. So that will be the last, the last thing. So in terms of challenges that are specific to RNA, uh, computational cost is a big challenge when it comes to aligning uh, RNA-seq data. So one lane of sequencing nowadays can generate hundreds and millions of reads. Uh, I've seen lanes, uh, for example, for HiSeq that are generating 900 million uh, reads. And that's a lot of reads that you're trying to, to align. It's, it's a lot of data. It requires a lot of computational resources. <coughs> and in addition to that, the, the RNA-seq data is challenging because we have um, the, the sequences that we're trying to align only contain exonic region. And we're trying to map it to a reference genome that contains introns and exons. So there are these gaps that we're going to have to take care of, the splice junctions that the aligner will have to take care of. And that's something not present in, in DNA. Um, also, the fact that it's unlikely that you will only align once and be done with, uh, with it. There, there are so many different data types that you can, and information that you can extract out of RNA-seq uh, from expression to fusions to uh, mutation calling. Each one of these tools uh, will have to be run on your FASTQ file. And each one of these tools gets updated so frequently. Like every year, there is every year or two years, there's a new version that will require you to go back and reprocess, depending on how major the update is. And in addition to that, also the, uh, the, uh, the transcript uh, dictionaries and the GTF files and uh, the annotation files that you're using, those get updated as well. The reference files get, get updated as well. Uh, and that will require you to reprocess. So that's a lot of reprocessing, a lot of computational cost uh, for every time, every time you're reprocessing. Um, and as I mentioned, there are a lot of aligners that are available out there. Uh, HiSat is just the one that we've picked today. And, um, but there are different classes of aligners in addition to HiSat. So there are mainly three different classes of aligners. So there's the de novo assembly um, aligners. There is the aligners where it takes the sequences and align them to a transcriptome reference. And there, there are aligners where you take the sequences and align them to a reference genome. And depending on your project or what you need uh, the RNA data for, you will have to pick one of those classes or an aligner from one of those classes. So for example, with de novo assembly, if you don't, if you don't have a reference genome, um, then you'll probably use a de novo uh, assembly. But most of the people here 
um, are using human, so the reference is available, so you might not need to use a de novo assembly. Uh, another uh, option is if the samples that you're dealing with they have a very high rate of polymorphism or mutations, uh, then you might want to do de novo because you don't want to miss uh, these um, when you're comparing it to a reference, a reference genome. Um, and the second option is to align to transcriptome. That's very rare. Most of the aligners are actually aligning to a ref reference uh, genome. Now, each one of these classes, they have a bunch of aligners that, again, gets updated every single year. This is a very cool uh, map. It's, it shows a timeline of all the different aligners, not specific to RNA, so RNA, DNA, bisulfide, and microRNAs. And it tells you at the, um, at the bottom, in the x-axis, you see the date they were published or released uh, to, the, to the scientific community. And I wanted to highlight um, two to three aligners that are uh, very big when it comes to RNA-seq, very important when it comes to RNA-seq. Uh, the first one is Top Hat, which was released around 2009. Uh, so each one, of these, each one of these aligners, when they are released, they're trying to do three things. They're trying to speed up the process of the alignment. They're trying to minimize the amount of memory that is used uh, to, to, to perform the alignment. And the third thing is that they're trying to maximize the quality of the, align, uh, the alignment. And I'm going to use, uh, let's, for example, use um, uh, 100 million reads, and I'm going to give you some metrics comparing the different aligners that I'll highlight. So top hat, uh, if we're trying to align 100 million reads, it will take 1,000 minutes to perform that. And um, the good thing is it did not require a lot of memory. So it only, it only needs 4 gigs of, of memory. Uh, but it, the only problem with that is it time. So it took, it took a lot of time to process those reads. The good thing about Top Hat is that a lot of people used it back in 2009. So it had a very good community. Chances are, if you have any questions um, when you're trying to run Top Hat and you're struggling, you will find an answer. Because a lot of people were using it at the time. Most of the answer is dressed. And, um, and uh, it's, it's a good starting point. So if you're trying to learn how to run things that are with RNA-seq, Top Hat is a good starting point. The second milestone was uh, when START was released back in around 2012. So what START was trying to do is trying to cut down on that processing time. They were trying to, uh, to, to speed up the process as much as possible. But So what they did is, for those 100 million reads, they were able to, to reduce the time from 1,000 minutes to 24 minutes, but at the cost of memory. So the memory went from 4 gig to 28 uh, uh, gigs, which is Hard to run on local machines, so you probably need a server to be able to run uh, to run these uh, these uh, samples. But the the cutting down of time is is very important because now uh, as as time goes by, you're actually producing more reads, and things were taking a lot longer with with Top Hat. But Star Star provided that solution where things were running a lot a lot quicker than than Top Hat. The, the third milestone is with HiSat. So what HiSat tried to do is try to, to cut down on the time and also the amount of memory used by using introducing uh, various indexing methods. So the way that you index the reference, uh, they came up with creative ways to do that to cut down on the memory used and the time. So the, uh, the no same number of reads that we talked about before, now it takes 20 minutes, same as star, and it only uses 4 gig of memory. So we're cutting down memory, cutting down on time. So when you're trying to decide whether or not you should uh, use SpliceAware or UnspliceAware, a mapper, um, the, the short answer is if you're aligning to a reference genome, you need a SpliceAware uh, aligner. If you're not, if you're aligning to a transcriptome, then you don't. So that's um, just a sim simple answer. And HiSat is a SpliceAware RNA-seq aligner. And HiSat stands for hier Hierarchical Index Spliced aligned transcriptome, I think. Um, and as I said, it requires a reference genome. It's very quick. And it uses a combination of uh, global indexing and local indexing. And I'll talk about what that, what that means uh, in a bit. So what, what HiSat did is that it took, so there is a global index, uh, which it, when it's tried to map or align the read, it will look for the, it'll try to anchor that read. We'll look through the genome to, to find the beginning for that read. And once it does, 
then it switches to local index. So we think of the whole genome and split it into bins. So it's split it, it's split it into 40, 48,000 bins, and those bins are overlapping. So now when you try to extend the read, instead of looking through the whole genome again, you're just going to look through those bins to speed up the process. So you're focusing on a smaller bin, and that will really speed up the alignment process. So it's a series of anchoring the read and extending the read, global index and local index. And it does that separately for read one and read two, if you have a pair. And then it collects information from uh, the, ma the mapping information and then puts it together and reports it to you. So let's go through, I'm going to go through three examples and we'll walk through how it does it uh, step by step. So the three examples here, the red chunk represents uh, uh, the read that you're trying to map. And then the two yellow uh, parts, these are two exons uh, and from the reference genome that you're trying to map to. And then the gray section is the intronic region in the reference, because I said the reference contains exon and introns. So the first example, you have a read that is um, fully spanned within the exon. So, so sorry, fully contained within an exon. Bless you. Um, the second example, you have a read that uh, most of it is uh, spanning exon 1, but then a small bit of it is actually spanning exon 2. And then the third example, you have a read where half of it is spanning exon 1 and the other half is spanning exon 2. So if we go through example, the first example, um, as I said, it's a series of global indexing and local indexing. So the first thing it does, it tries to anchor or find a beginning of that read. So it will try to, to anchor the first 28 bases using the global uh, indexing. And once it finds the location in the genome of where this read belongs, then it just starts a series of extension. So it extends the bases up until the last base. Uh, it doesn't find any mismatches. It keeps adding bases, and then it's good. The second example is the same thing. It tries to find a, a location or tries to anchor that read within the genome. So it does the first 28 bases using global indexing. And then it starts extending, extending, extending. But then it encounters a mismatch. So that mismatch represents the splice junction, the presence of a splice junction. So it stops. And now it switches to local index. So previously, what Top Hat uh, used to do is that when it stops, it goes through the whole genome and tries to find a location for that little chunk that, that's left. And that was very time consuming. So with the local index, instead of going through the whole genome now, because we know what bin uh, this the first the first part of the read belongs to uh, we can just look within that bin and see where we can uh, uh, identify this, this chunk that's left so that's what it does it goes and anchors the, the first eight bases um, of the the piece that's left and then it, it continues the uh, extension so the first time you need 28 bases to anchor the first part this the second for the local index you only need eight bases to uh, to anchor and you only need eight because you're looking within a smaller space. So the, uh, it's, it's, things are more unique within smaller spaces. The third scenario is exactly the same. You start, you anchor the first 28 bases, you then you do lo uh, local, uh, you do extension, and then once you encounter the first mismatch, again, you look within your uh, local bin, you um, anchor, again, eight bases, and then you continue extending. So it's a series of global indexing, local indexing, anchoring, and extend, extension. Uh, that's pretty much the idea behind, behind HiSat. How do you know that the, this chunk that separate belongs to the bin, right? Like, you got... oh, you, oh, yeah, you're trying to match the sequence to, to uh, the sequences within that bin. But the sequence doesn't, I mean, it's not present in the DNA, it's present in the RNA. The DNA, there is an intron between the so yeah. yeah. How does it know? How does it know that you, because the RNA is combined with two pieces, right? Yeah. But if you go to the reference genome, there is there is a gap. Between. Yeah. So it's trying to mine the gap and then look after the gap. So it is it is going to take the gap into consideration. That's why you you you're looking within within the bins, right? That's why you're breaking the whole genome into bins. Uh, it's gonna it's I mean it won't find it in the intronic region, but it will find it in the down, downstream, right? The intron will find it in the other axon. And then I'll say, okay, well, there is this giant gap between this chunk and the beginning. So I'm going to take this chunk and classify it as a splice junction. That's how it actually builds a dictionary of splice junctions by 
locating the exonic parts or matching the exonic parts in the reference and whatever that's missing between the two exons is it's going to hypothesize that it's an intronic region. How does it differentiate between that and its region or like deletion for example? It's uh, the, the, the distance. So these are parameters that you can tweak. So you can set, okay, I, I want the maximum distance between the two uh, chunks to be this. Anything beyond this will be a fusion. Um, and I think for HiSat to call fusions, uh, you, you, you call another um, function, HiSat specific for, for fusions. But yeah, you're right. It's, it's the threshold, the threshold that you specify. After this distance, uh, will probably be classified as a fusion. And below this threshold, then it'll probably be a splice junction. So we'll do this separately, and then we'll come up with a dictionary or a list of all the possible potential splice junctions. It will take a look at the splice junctions that you provided it uh, with. If you have evidence or you know that there are splice junction presence, uh, a good annotation, you can provide it. It will use that as a guide as well. It will compare what it found with what you provided uh, and, and see if it's, if it's a match, uh, and, and so on. Does that make sense? Does that process make sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, so after you perform the alignment, you might get some reads that map to multiple locations uh, the same quality. So that's those are called multi-mapped reads. With DNA aligners, what they do is they usually uh, there are different options. They either pick the, the the first one that comes on that list if they all have the same exact quality, or it randomly selects from uh, those reads. So with RNA, it's up to you how you want to deal with them. Usually if you're uh, dealing with expression, if you're assessing expression from RNA-seq, you would leave multi-map, you'll allow multi-map reads. But if you're doing uh, variant calling, again, it's up to you whether or not you want to get rid of uh, th that option or maybe select one of the reads that uh, are mapping to multiple locations within the genome or the transcriptome. Now, so after, after it does the alignment, um, you, what you get, you get a BAM file. How many of you have worked with a BAM file in, in general in the past? Okay, cool. So um, we actually get not a BAM file, you get a SAM file. So remember the FASTQ that we, that we looked at, which contained all the sequences that we actually um, uh, sequenced, the, the RNA sequences. So with the SAM file is very similar to the FASTQ, except that you're getting the sequence, but you're getting a lot more information. So for each sequence that is present in the FASTQ, you're also getting information about where it is located in the genome now. So it will tell you, okay, I was able to uh, locate this on chromosome nine, this position, and I was able to map it with this quality. And each base gets a quality, the whole string gets a quality, so you get a lot more information. But the idea is that every, every piece that you pass it in the FASTQ, you will get it out in the SAM file, in the align file. And if it couldn't map it, then it will tell you, I, this string I was not able to map. Um, so it will have a flag for that as well. So a SAM file is, you can think of it as a text file. It's a text file. You can actually open it up. It's not recommended because you will get like a lot of, a lot of information, a lot of reads. Uh, so what what people do is usually they compress it to BAM. So BAM is the compressed version. You save a lot of space by doing that, doing it that way. And um, what you need to do is also you need to index the BAM file so that when a lot of tools can actually work with BAM file directly, you don't have to uh, unzip the BAM file to SAM. Uh, you can parse reads from the BAM file uh, if you have a proper index uh, along with it. So with, this is what a, a BAM file uh, looks like. It mainly consists of two pieces. So you have the header, uh, which contains information about the run uh, and, and the tools that were used to run it. And I'll, I'll go through the, an example of a header. And then you have the body, which consists of the sequences that you pass, along with all the information that I just told you, where it mapped it and what the quality of the map uh, is like. So um, I think I've mentioned all of that. You need an index for your, for your BAM. So what, what, does, uh, what information can you find in the header? Uh, this is a list of information, so you'll have the version number, you're, you'll have information about how the alignments were sorted. Were they sorted uh, according to position or according to read, read name? Uh, you will have information about the reference that was used. Uh, what type, what, what a version of the reference that you used? Was it human? Was it uh, something else, another species? And also the individual uh, chromosomes that were used. What were they called and how long would, uh, was each chromosome? How many bases? And uh, you'll have information about the read, uh, the name of the sequencing center, sample name, library name, 
uh, and then information about the program that you use to do the alignment. So in this case, it will be HiSat, what version of HiSat. And the idea is that by looking at the header, you should be able to reprocess the sample. If I look at the header, I'll, I will know what was used to process it. I can go back and reprocess it using these parameters. It will have all the parameters. It actually have the command that was used to run uh, the alignment. So you can go back and then say, okay, I know all these parameters. I can just go back and, and tweak them or run the same thing uh, again. The body contains information about the alignments. So this is a list of, uh, you can think of these as columns. So they are actually pretty much columns in your, in your body. So uh, queue name is just the uh, name of the read, for example. Flag is, uh, I'll talk about flag and cigar in more details in a bit, but uh, flag is just uh, trying to compress as much information about the, uh, the read as, as possible in a number, and I'll tell you exactly what, that, what, what it means in a bit. Uh, our name is the chromosome, so what chromosome uh, it aligned to. Uh, position, mapping quality, cigar string, I'll talk about that uh, as well. It pretty much describes how the bases were aligned within that read. And um, you'll get information about whether or not this was the first read in your pair or the second uh, read in your pair and whether uh, the second uh, read in the pair mapped on the same chromosome or a different chromosome. And you can use that information to uh, figure out if it's a fusion, for example. So at the bottom of this slide, you'll see an example of, uh, of, of all these uh, values. So here we have a, a string name, which looks very similar to the FASTQ that we looked at. And you can actually, it is, it is pretty much the same. So you can actually pull this read from the FASTQ file if you're interested by looking at the read, read uh, name. Uh, and it's saying it mapped to chromosome 1, position was 11623, the mapping quality is 3, and the cigar string is 100M, and I'll tell you what, uh, what that means. Uh, equals means the, the next uh, read in the pair uh, actually aligned to the same chromosome. So if this is pair 1, uh, then the second read mapped also on the same chromosome, so it's not um, a fusion. The, and how far? It will tell you how far, how many bases downstream was the second, uh, the second pair. And then you get the sequence, the, the actual sequence, the whole read, and then the quality, uh, you get a quality per base within that read. So what is the, what's the flag? So that's, what's that second column that we were talking about? So the, the flag is a 12 uh, bitwise flag uh, that describes the alignment. So think of it as trying to compress 11 columns into one number. So you're trying to condense all that information into one, one number. And what that number is telling you is giving you information about uh, whether or not the read was mapped, uh, whether or not the, um, the second pair uh, of the read is mapped, um, whether or not it's the first or the second uh, read uh, pair, uh, was, whether it was a primary alignment or a secondary alignment, uh, whether it was a PCR uh, a duplicate, whether it was a supplementary alignment. So you're trying to condense as much information about the alignment as possible within, within that number. And it's not, you can't just look at the number and know what it means. You have, there's a website that actually breaks it down for you. So you put the, if you go to the website the link and you put um, uh, the number, then it will tell you all the different uh, uh, description points that it actually that number represents because you can combine all of these into that bit, 12-bit uh, uh, wise number of flag. So um, the cigar, what the cigar does, it actually describes for every base in your read, what was the alignment like? So if you look at the example that I have here, that's uh, 81M, 859N19M. Uh, so that's an example of a, a value that it will have in that, in that column. So what this is saying is that within your read, I was able to map the first 81 bases. And then there was a gap of 859 bases in the reference genome. And then the final 19 uh, bases of your read, I was able to go. Do you know what that represents? What does that mean? So it mapped the first 81 bases and then, and so if you sum the 81 and 19, that's 100. That's the, the, the read length. So it mapped, it was able to map the first 81 and then the last 19. But it couldn't, the, there was a, there was a 850. Sorry? It's in, it's the intronic region. So it's a splice junction. 
So saying that I, I mapped the first bit of the read, because that probably belonged to exon 1, and then I mapped the second part of the read, that's probably exon 2, and then there was a gap, and that gap probably represents an intronic region. So you can visually, by looking at that cigar, kind of have an idea of how each base was aligned within, within your read. So now that uh, you know what BAM, BAM files look like, um, BAM files are huge, and a lot of times you're interested in looking at a specific region within the BAM. You don't want to look at everything. So if you have a specific gene that you're interested in, you want to pull that region from the BAM file and just look at that. If, for example, if you want to look at IGV, how many people have used IGV before? Okay, so IGV is a way to visualize uh, your, your aligned reads. Um, I don't know if we're going to have a chance to actually do IGV. Are you doing IGV tomorrow? Yeah. You're doing IGV tomorrow? Okay, cool. Um, so you, what IGV does, you can load the BAM file and then you'll be able to see all the reads and you'll see if there are any mismatches uh, and, and how the reads were aligned. And you can actually add tracks, like uh, gene annotation tracks, so you'll know where the reads piled up, what gene, uh, what, uh, uh, whether it, what strand uh, the expression is coming from, the forward or the reverse uh, strand, and so on. So it's a very visual way, uh, way of uh, looking at the, the alignments. However, some BAM files are huge, so if you want to subset them, then you can use BED files. So a BED file is a text file that contains uh, columns, chromosome, uh, start, end, and then uh, gene name, for example. And you can use SAM tools or BED tools to subset your BAM file using specific regions that you put in your BED file. So if you're looking at one gene, two genes, ten genes, you can put those genes in your BED file and then use tools like SAM tools or PET tools to uh, only extract those regions and then look at them in IGV or do whatever you want uh, with them. Um, so besides um, uh, SAM tools, there's BAM tools, there's Picard, there's uh, BET tools and BET ops. All these tools you can use to index your BAM file, convert your BAM to SAM and vice versa, and also subset your BAM files. You can also use them to sort your BAM file. Um, and there are two different ways you can sort your BAM file. You can either sort them according to position, as I've mentioned before, or to, uh, according to read name. And if you're interested in uh, retrieval of uh, the reads uh, um, fa in a faster way, then sort them according to position. But if you're interested in maintaining that relationship between the pairs, uh, and for example, if you're looking for fusion and you want to you wanna pull the two reads from that specific pair, then maybe you should sort them according to read name, because uh, uh, if, you do, if you do it that way, then that information will be uh, maintained. So BED is just a subset of a BED? BED is just, uh, you just put coordinates. So it's a text file, it's a separate text file, and you just put in coordinates. So you just put chromosome, position, uh, and, and, and gene name, for example. And then you pass these tools, you pass them both the BAM file and the BED and then you generate a new file. You either generate a new BAM file, or you can generate a new text file. It's also good for coverage, so you can, it will tell you how many reads, for example, overlap these regions that you specified in your bet. So if you're interested in QC or coverage, then you can say, okay, what's the coverage like in those regions? Can you tell me how many reads overlap those, those regions? So this is what IGV uh, kind of looks like. I was talking about that earlier. Um, you have the, uh, at the top, you have the chromosomes, um, uh, the P, P arm and Q arm, and these represent the reads. So each one of these lines represents uh, a, a single read. At the bottom here, you have the uh, annotation, the transcript, transcript annotation. Uh, so the exons, the intronic region, that, those are the uh, known annotations. So you load, you load these. And then the idea is that you compare the coverage of your read, uh, the distribution of the coverage of your reads, to what is uh, the, the transcript assembly. Ideally, you don't want to see pileup of reads on the entron intronic regions, because that shouldn't happen unless your uh, annotation is not a good representation or of, of what samples you're working with or they're not up to date, maybe you discovered a novel uh, splice junction that was not in the, in the annotation. But ideally what you want is you want your reads to pile up where the exons are um, in the annotation file. And we see that here. Yes? Uh, so what are those uh, red things that are not connected to each other? So yeah. that reads that cannot be aligned? Or... Which ones? These ones? 
uh, well, those are on the left, just this, on the top of single. <laughs> like that. Those things. Yes. Yeah. Here, there is a line in between. Yeah, yeah. And there, there is no line. So yeah, yeah. So, I, yeah, I. That's a good question. I don't know what. Uh, are those single reads? But then I don't know why it couldn't identify. I think what's being shown here is actually it's not showing the pair in the O, it's just showing single reads that span across exon exon junctions. Yeah, but uh, what about like this chunk right here? Yeah, so that's like, there is no connection. Does it not span across a junction? It just aligns as one chunk to that region. Yeah. It looks like just reads from the introns. That's yeah. It. They're just, just the 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 Yeah. Um, I'm just trying to think, like, it's 100 of these base uh, reads, so I guess it was only able to align. Um, Do they look shorter? shorter? Sorry. No. Yeah, yeah, it's hard to solve for this. It could uh, be a partial yeah, alignment, though, actually. Could it be that it was trimmed? That's also possible. Um, and the thing is, I mean, I think it also samples. You're not seeing all the reads in, in here. Uh, it takes a sample of, of your reads. And there are so many different parameters and visualization you can turn on and off. Uh, so it's hard by looking at just that without actually interactively uh, checking the reads and, and figuring out what, uh, what they represent. In general, though, where, where do you think these, these reads come from, these intronic reads? What's the explanation for them being there? Could be repetitive, so that could be something that's sort of misaligning there. It's not clear where it aligns. It's one possibility. Yeah, mature mRNA. So there could be the sample has RNAs that aren't completely processed, which inevitably there will be some amount of RNA that, like at the time you broke open all those cells, there was some RNA that was in the process of being spliced together. So you have some intron from that those sequences. It could also be genomic DNA. There's nothing to say it has to be RNA, right? So remember I said we did do a DNA's treatment, but that's not perfect. So there will be some low-level amount of genomic DNA in every RNA seq sample, and they could legitimately be that that intron is sometimes retained on purpose. Um, so it's a mix of all of those things. Probably some other things I'm forgetting about right now. Yeah. Well, it could also be a new splice junction that's not a novel. It could, yeah, it could be a new exon. Yeah, yeah. a new exon that wasn't yeah. discovered so before. You could imagine that there was a, a chunk of exon here that corresponded to those things. So then, I mean, when you get back to the data in your RNA seq, were you classifying that as? Do you classify that as a count for your transcript, or would you ignore it? Because I mean, it depends on the details of how the counting is done. Um, so when we do that, the expression estimation. Yeah probably talk more about those details, but most approaches they'll wind up being ignored because they're either not part of the sort of predicted assembled transcript that you sort of build de novo from the RNA-seq data, or they're not part of an exon in one of the main transcripts of your GTF file, or they don't correspond to the Kamer index that Callisto built. Each of those methods relies on some prior knowledge of the exons are to some degree. So the stuff that's in the introns, if you want to sort of go back and analyze those and say, oh, maybe that does represent an al a novel alternative isoform, that would be kind of like a separate analysis path you would go down, whereas you would specifically sort of start to take those think those um, additional leads into account. Yeah, and most of the, uh, the expression quantification tools, they look at properly paired reads. So like the single, the single end reads that might not have been properly paired I don't know if we would take those into consideration when it's trying to quantify uh, expression for that for that region. Yes. Do the rows mean anything? Each well, each row is a read, right? So, but for example, in the first row you have a whole bunch of red boxes. Yep. That's all coming from one read. Uh, it could be. Probably um, not. They're kind yeah. of just really close together, and you're seeing. Um, it's hard to see the edges because they start and end so close. Basically, what IGB does is it tries to pack as much information as possible, as efficiently as possible, 
into the top, and then it only goes down to the next row when it runs out of space. So you tend to get this pattern where it looks more sparse as you go further down because it's trying to to efficiently use the space. Yeah, I think if there's overlap, it would put them on different rows. Yeah, if but they if they're overlap, if they're overlap, they they're on separate rows. One base but if, apart, yeah, yeah, no, they would be on the same row. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, but again, it's it's imperfect. So the inevitably some genomic DNA has some homology to the oligo-DT beans, and so it sticks and it doesn't get washed away. But you may see, yeah, I would say compared to the total RNA approach, you will see less immature uh, messenger or immature RNA and genomic DNA do the poly selection you do enrich for um, the stuff that's that's really mRNA's signal. And similarly, if you do the cDNA capture, it also tends to clean up. You'll see a lot less just scattered reads in intragenic space or in the introns. The noisiest one is probably the, the total RNA with the ribo reduction, but it's a trade-off. You can also see some real signal in the introns that corresponds to antisense transcripts or bubble. All right. Skip that. Um, so the next, the next part of this module is the QC assessment. So we're going to be looking at a few metrics that can help us uh, uh, tell if the library construction went well, if the alignments actually worked, and if we can actually move, take these samples and then move forward to expression estimation, or if we should go back and realign. Uh, uh, redo the sequencing and, and so on. I think this is this alignment step is one of the most crucial alignment steps uh, um, so far. So most of the metrics that I'm mentioning here today, we're using a tool called R6C, and I think we've provided instructions on how to install that tool. But feel free to use whatever tool that you think is suitable for you. We're just providing these metrics as a guide, so you can even go and look for these uh, metrics in another tool. You can even construct these metrics your, yourself using the BAM, the BED, and some BED tools. Uh, it's e you can easily put these together. So one of the first metrics that I usually look at when I try to assess the quality of the, uh, the RNA-seq, aligned RNA-seq, is the uh, bias. So whether or not there's any bias presence in, in the sample. And I do that by looking at the coverage distribution across the transcript. So here, what uh, RCC is doing is that it's taking all the transcripts and it's trying to um, uh, split them into 100 bins. And it's, it's normalizing. So um, it's looking at each bin in those transcripts and it's trying to find the coverage in each one of these bins. And that's what you're looking at here. So you're looking at uh, the, 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 the bins and the coverage for each one of these bins. Because transcript, transcripts will have different lengths, so that's why they're splitting them into equal number of, of bins. And ideally what you want to see is you want to see equal coverage from the beginning of the gene to the end of the gene, beginning of the transcript to the end of the transcript. Um, so what we're seeing here, for example, we're seeing two groups of samples or libraries where one group has equal coverage across the gene body, while another group, there seems to be uh, an, an over the one, one area of the of the gene is highly covered while the other part is not covered at all and this is five to three so the three end is uh, covered very well where the five end is not uh, is not covered and there so there seems to be clear uh, coverage bias uh, any idea where this could be coming from poly a yeah any other suggestions sorry Single end reads. Um, why would they contribute to this bias? Because this, with a single end, you also expect to see you, you expect them to be normally distributed across the whole transcript, right? Um, how? Sorry. Degradation, exactly. Yeah. So degradation uh, or or poly A selection. So. When you look at this and, and, and you see this, this bias in the coverage, uh, you really need to stop and, and ask all these questions. What happened to cause this? 
was it the library construction? Maybe the library uh, kit that I, I, we, we chose was not proper. Maybe there was a problem during library prep. We need to go back and figure uh, where this is coming from. If this degradation, let's go back and look at the RIN numbers uh, that uh, for, for before sequencing. Uh, where did they have bad RINs and we just sequenced them anyways? Uh, and then, so you try to figure out what step of the process, uh, what step of the process ca caused this. Now. Ideally, what you want to do is you want to fix it by going back and rerunning things, either rerunning the libraries or uh, resequencing. But this sometimes can be very uh, uh, costly, and sometimes you're just given the data and you can't really do anything about it. it it's, it's important to um, uh, detect this because you can actually do some downstream adjustments as well. So one example is you can identify the, the samples that have bias and then flag them downstream when you're doing the modeling to do, do differential expression. You can add a feature uh, and say, okay, these samples belong to this group. Uh, so that if you find anything that's differentially expressed, you make sure that you're adjusting for uh, this, this bias. As long as you know, you can adjust for it downstream, if you can't upstream. Um, another thing that I look at is the nucleotide content within the read. So random primers are used uh, in the step where we take RNA uh, and then we reverse complement them to uh, uh, cDNA. And they're called random, and they're supposed to be random, but um, what ends up happening is that um, sometimes they cause this bias um, where you expect the, uh, the, the nucleotide content to be 25% uh, each, ACGT, because it's a random process. But what ends up happening is that some bases uh, tend to have uh, tend to be uh, selected at a higher rate than others for the first few bases of the read. So in this graph, we're looking at uh, a very short read, only 35 bases long, and we notice that the first zero to 10 bases, uh, there seems to be this uh, fluctuation in the um, in the nucleotides, uh, and then it stabilizes after. So one thing that you can do is to uh, first plot this and see if this actually happens uh, in your Illumina data. And if it does, then one way to deal with it is to trim the first 10 bases of your data. So if you trim it, then, um, then you can just use the rest of the data. So you can use the 90, the 90 bases that's left of your read to perform the, the alignment. Um, and you can, what you can do is you can keep it and look at the alignment rates, trim it, and then look at the alignment rates and see if trimming actually affects your alignments and it, uh, if it does, then it's highly recommended that you, you trim that, that portion. Uh, you can also look at the distribution of the quality within each base of the re your read. So here we're also looking at the same short read, 35 bases long. And for each base, we're looking at the uh, FRED, uh, FRED, FRED quality score. So that's what the BAM file reports. It reports the quality score, FRED score. What is a FRED score? It's simply the negative log 10 of the probability that the base calling was uh, done incorrectly. So FRED score of 30, for example, means that there is one in a thousand chance that this base was not called correctly. Um, and what you want is you want uh, the higher the, the FRED score, the better, because the less the chance that it's, it's wrong. So you want um, FRED score, anything that's higher than 30 is acceptable. You do see when you look at the read, towards the end of the read, uh, the quality uh, declines, and that's expected. But as long as most of your uh, the bases within your read, they're above Q30, then that's, that's uh, acceptable. If they're not, then what you can do is you can trim. So you can trim your bases and get rid of the, the last few bases of your read that are below uh, Q30. Uh, PCR duplication, I think this was briefly mentioned uh, earlier dealing with PCR du duplication uh, in RNA-seq versus DNA-seq. Uh, one way of assessing uh, whether or not you should collapse your, your reads in RNA-seq is to look at this uh, plot, for example. Uh, on the x-axis, you're looking at um, uh, 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 occurrence of the reads, and then the y-axis is the uh, number of, of, of reads. So what that means is that uh, here we're looking at the we're comparing the reads that have the same exact sequence and the same exact start and end. So that's, if, if they have the same exact sequence and the same exact start, uh, start and end, we call them duplicates. And then on the x-axis we're saying there is um, the level of duplication. 
and how many reads have that level of duplication. So what you want ideally is you want uh, the curve to be as low as possible uh, because you want to minimize the, the number of reads that have high duplication rate as much as possible. A bad, a very bad sample would have a very high, uh, high plot. So what's the difference between getting rid of the duplications and then trying to figure out how what's the um, the density of, of expression of a certain gene, the number of transcripts. Does, am I making Yeah, yeah. So that, no, no, you're, you're right. Yeah, because collapsing, if you're collapsing the reads, then you're actually affecting the dynamic range of the expression. Because expression is pretty much counting the, the number of reads that overlap a specific region. But those reads that have the same exact start and same exact end, we're not sure if these are uh, uh, true expression come from true expression or their PCR artifact. So that's the challenge, right? Um, you have to make sure that they're actually PCR before you collapse them. Because if they're not and you're collapsing them, you're actually reducing their expression profile if they're actually true, true uh, reads coming from true fragments. So you need to make sure that they are coming from PCR uh, 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 artifacts and then you collapse. If you're not sure, then just leave the, the reads and don't collapse them, because that will affect your expression. Okay, and are you about to tell us how we will know that? Well, this, so this is, <laughs> this is, this is how, trying to help you with that uh, by looking, by comparing the two reads, the start and end, and the, uh, the sequence. The, the read coverage should not pile up when you're looking at um, um, coverage. Okay, let me use a board maybe. So when you're looking at, um, DNA coverage, for example, you expect the reads to kind of overlap. And you don't expect them to all pile up with the same exact start and end, because this could be a sign that it's PCR. What you want is you want this. You want some sort of overlap between, between the reads. Now, the challenge is this is with DNA, because uh, with DNA, there is no fixed start points. With transcription and RNA, there are actually fixed start points. Should, these are the transcription sites. So you kind of do sometimes expect to have some sort of piling up. So the rates of seeing this in RNA is higher than DNA. And that's why it's more of a challenge, because then you look at this and you say, OK, is this transcription or is this PCR? And that's why you're trying to uh, distinguish between, between the two. So, you could, I guess, look at transcription site and then ch and check if the duplication is happening around those regions. You just have to do a lot more investigation when it comes to RNA uh, versus DNA. With DNA, when you see this, you just collapse uh, the reads. But you're right. If it's actually true expression and you're collapsing, the expression range will differ, and, and that's not good. Okay, yeah. thank you. You're welcome. Uh, another thing that you can uh, check is um, sequencing depth. So I think this was also addressed earlier when... Um, one of the questions was how, how many lanes of sequencing should we do for the specific project or uh, how many uh, samples can we pull in one lane, how deep can we go? Uh, and again, it really def depends on the project that you're trying to do, the question you're trying to answer, are you doing fusion, are you doing variant calling, are you doing expression? Um, but one way you can do that is you can run one full lane of, of data for just one sample. And then take and map it, take the BAM file, and then do a, a saturation analysis. So take the BAM file, but subset the read within that BAM file. So let's say you had 500 million reads in that BAM file. You, you start by taking 50, random 50 million reads, 100, 200, 300, 400, 500. And at each point, you look at the number of slight splice junctions that you can actually detect. No, novel splice junctions and known splice junctions. And then you, so you're interested in a point where you start saturating. So as you add reads, are you actually adding more information or does that information <laughs> saturate? So you get to 300 millions and then you add more reads, but the number of splice junctions you're detecting is not increasing. And that's what we're trying to visualize here. We're looking here at um, the known junctions are in red and you can see that they saturate a lot earlier than novel junctions. And that's because there are a lot of false positive junctions that uh, gets generated from these tools. So, I mean, it's a balance of looking at the, the known and the novel. So you, you, want, you want to look at both and then see at what point do I stop. I'm not adding any more information. 
that's one way of looking at it, because here you're just looking at splice junction. If you're interested in other things, like for example, uh, gene families. So you can also look at the expression of gene families and see, okay, as I add reads, how is the expression changing? And am I introducing new gene numbers in the families? Am I seeing new things as I, I add uh, reads? And that's uh, a low cost experiment that you can do on just one sample. And then once you figure out, okay, I think I need about, I don't know, 100 million reads. That sounds like enough for my project. You can go back and then do the same thing on the rest of the, of the sample. As long as the sample that you picked is a good representation of the rest of the samples within your, your cohort, then that will be one idea of figuring out how deep you should go. Um, the other thing, uh, also, you can look at the base distribution. So all the bases that you've aligned, what is the composition of these bases? Are they coding bases? Are they non-coding bases? Um, and you can do pie charts to uh, help you with that. And that could actually uh, tell you if your library kit works. So for example, if you're using poly A selection, you're expecting to see a higher fraction of uh, coding bases. If you're using um, um, uh, other forms like whole transcriptome, for example, you expect to see less coding bases and more non-coding bases. What do you mean coding bases? Bases? Yeah, well, uh, in the ex exonic. Uh, bases, yeah, versus like intronic, um, uh, ribosomal, stuff like that, like um, UTR bases, um, exonic bases, um, and that will help you with like contamination as well, if, uh, detecting contamination, like uh, like you mentioned earlier, like or uh, if we see any DNA or genomic contamination, then we'll be able to see that in those in those fraction. It will, yeah, it will be different. So you'll have less coding bases, you'll have more uh, intergenic or intronic, intronic bases, they'll be a lot higher. This is kind of what you're expecting in general, the proportion? Yeah, well, again, it depends on the library, right? Like poly A, you'll probably see more uh, more coding, whole transcriptome, you'll see a bit less because you're getting more ribosomal uh, with, with that. So it really depends on the library. But as long as you see consistency across the samples and then it matches what library you've actually what kit you used, then you should be good. Do you do, you do the basis just because it's a higher level of granularity? Is that the only reason you, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, the other thing that we can you can look at is the insert size. Uh, so that's pretty much the distance between the two uh, paired reads. There are different definitions of insert size. You can look at uh, the distance between, um, so, I mean, they're called different things. So you, you have a fragment, which is looking at the uh, distance, including the actual read and including the adapters. When uh, you look at insert size, when you use the word insert, that's um, the distance from the beginning of read one to the end of read two. And then uh, innermate is the distance of between the end of read one and the beginning of read two. These terminologies were used in uh, Top Hat. I don't know if I actually, they're actually used in HiSat anymore, but just keep that in mind that there are different ways of looking at the distance. You can either uh, include or not include the reads, include or not include the adapters. So when you're looking at these numbers, ask yourself that or make sure you know whether or not it includes that information because the reads are pretty big, like if it's 100, then that makes a, a difference. That's 200, whether or not you include them or not include them in, in, that, in those calculations. Um, and that's an example of um, uh, an insert size plot. And what you expect to see is you only expect to see one, one distribution, a normal distribution. And then when you end up seeing bimodal distributions, then you're, you're probably selecting uh, another, another fragment uh, size. Um, uh, ideally, what you want is just you want one, one distribution, one normal distribution uh, of, of fragment size. Uh, and the other thing is, uh, do you notice anything wrong with this as well? Beside the fact that it's my bimodal, when you're looking at the actual size itself. You have a minus? Yes. What, how, did, how did that happen? How can I have a minus library size? Okay, how did that happen? Uh, okay. 
So the the these are the this is the fragment that you have, right? And then you sequence these two reads, um, and this is the gap in between them is what you're trying to visualize here. But it's saying that there is a minus. Sorry. Exactly. The reads are running into each other. So what's happening is that you're picking a fragment size that's small. So your fragment size, for example, is 100 bases, but you decided to do uh, 100 uh, bases reads. So if the, your fragment size is 100 and you're going 100 this way and then 100 this way, your reads are actually overlapping. So you're, you're sequencing the same fragment twice from both ends. Ideally, what you want is you want your fragment size to be big enough so that you can actually sequence from this end and from this end and still have some space in between. So the, the shorter the fragment size, um, the, the more negative values you're going to get because they're going to start overlapping. Um, and that's not, that's not very desirable. So usually reads are 100 bases. So you, you try to pick fragment size that's, let's say, around 300. So they can have at least 100 bases between. It's a distribution. Not everything is going to be uh, exactly uh, the same, but uh, you want to make sure that the fragment size is large enough so that you don't run into this issue. And you mentioned that if it's bimodal, you can, you're can probably getting reading a fragment from a different... Like how, how can you get it bimodal? Uh, I mean, if your um, uh, size selection didn't work, like you, you picked multiple sizes instead of just one. You know how you do... Uh, you run it through uh, uh, through gel electrophoresis, and then you pick you pick a specific band. So maybe you picked uh, a multiple. Um, yeah, uh, and the reason why you don't want to have that is uh, because now you're getting two reads that come from the same fragment. If you're doing variant calling, for example, what you want is you want reads that are coming from different fragments. You want that's, That provides better evidence of a mutation. If the two reads are coming from the same fragment, that's not, the, these reads are not independent. And a lot of the tools when they're doing variant calling, they're assuming that the reads are actually independent. But these ones are not independent. So you're introducing some sort of a bias uh, when you're doing mutation uh, calling. I don't think it really matters much with expression. It's mainly the variant calling that uh, gets affected by this. Yes. So how do you address this analysis? Uh, it's a good question. So again, with expression, I don't think it matters that much. But if you if you care so much about it and you think that it's introducing a bias, maybe you can uh, shorten the reads. I mean, you are losing information, so you have to do some tests where you reduce the number of the uh, the, the length of the reads, the trim, and then see if um, if that changes the calls, the variant calls that you've you've called earlier. Um, this is just uh, it's a very simple slide of how you can look for variance in IGV. We're not doing IGV today, so maybe we'll save that till tomorrow. But uh, again, when use of IGV is, uh, it will detect any bases that are different from the reference base and it will highlight them for you. So that's also one way where if you already have variants in DNA that you've called and you want to kind of validate by looking at the RNA to see if those variants are present, you can take um, uh, the bed file that I told you about earlier, make a list of all the variants that you have from your DNA, go to the BAM, pull those regions from the BAM, and then visualize it this way. And then look through those variants that you detected from your DNA to see if they're present in, in RNA, RNA or not. Ideally, you want to do an actual validation, but that's just that's another way of making sure that the variants you, you picked up in DNA are also present in, in RNA using completely different technology. So that's the end of um, this session. Any more questions? So tomorrow we're going to be doing the uh, practical uh, session where you will take the FASTQ files and then you will run the alignments yourself. Uh, and then we're doing expression as well tomorrow. So you'll, you'll do the expression part as well. But I think at the beginning of the day we might do the alignments first. Uh, and then we'll jump into uh, expression. Cool.